I think it was about three years ago that we were approached by Rob Wolf, who I'll be introducing here, um, who was interested in learning more about regenerative grazing and how that could tie in with their movement for health. And it's been an ongoing conversation that we've had with him. He's been tremendously supportive. He's really dug into the work that we do um, and got to understand holistic management for really the decision-making framework that it is. And so it's with great pleasure that I get to introduce Rob Wolf. I don't know where Rob Wolf. Huge honor to be here. Uh, so we had about a 50% suicide rate on my second talk yesterday. Um, I used the talk that uh, if I'm going to go speak to a hospital or hospital system or a bunch of doctors and I'm going to beat them down, then that's the talk I use. I wasn't trying to beat folks down in that one, but um, yeah, it was kind of a mess, so I apologize for that. Uh, quick question, how many people in here are ranchers or food producers? Wow, okay. So, little secret for y'all, you guys are going to save the world. Yeah, yeah no pressure though. <laughs> Who in here is not a rancher or a food producer? Okay, all of us need to patronize and buy from the folks that are actually producing the food, and we need to kick everybody that we know in the, the patukas to uh, start patronizing these folks so that we create decentralized, resilient food production and distribution hubs. And uh, what, what I want to share with you today is a little bit of my story uh, going further back. I was a research biochemist in my past life, uh, got into cancer and autoimmunity research due to a health crisis, got into this paleo diet concept about 17 years ago, and really have seen a lot of benefit from that. Um, I took a completely 90 degree turn from research and opened a gym uh, back in 2004. I co-founded the first and fourth CrossFit gyms in the world back in 2003, 2004. Uh, had a huge falling out with those guys because I'm kind of an asshole sometimes, so I, I got in trouble with them. And, uh, uh, but I, I really, uh, growing up, I liked two things. I liked science and I liked working out and being in a gym. So I don't really have a lot of social skills or anything <laughs> beyond that. So, uh, but I actually do like people a lot. And so I, I opened a gym. And using the, the methodology that, that I discovered with this evolutionary biology ancestral health template, uh, we opened a gym called NorCal Strength and Conditioning in Chico, California back in, in 2004. And we became rather successful quite quickly because when we worked with our folks, I started things off thinking about sleep and food and exercise and gut microbiota and socialization from this kind of evolutionary biology perspective. And my, hopefully if I pull this thing off properly, usually this talk is about an hour and 15 minutes and I have like 30 minutes minus the time that I spent outside talking with somebody answering a question to uh, pull this thing off. So hopefully I, I weave this all together. But the early days of running the gym, it was, it was quite interesting. Uh, nobody had heard about this paleo concept. Nobody was really thinking about sustainability or anything like that. And talking to folks about it was, was really pulling teeth. This is just an interesting thing that still exists on the, the internet. Uh, the local co-op uh, was really economically impacted when Trader Joe's came to town because folks started buying a lot of their food from, from Trader Joe's. Uh, the, this co-op was a, very, a vegetarian, vegan co-op. And the biggest complaint that these folks received from their, their patrons was that People could not buy their, their pastured meat products and butter and eggs and all that uh, from within the store. So they would have to shop at one place and then go to Chico Natural Foods and shop someplace else. And they were really uh, facing some economic, serious economic challenges. Uh, it almost made them fail. They did eventually have to um, start selling some meat to be able to stay, you know, stay competitive and stay open. But back around 2004, finding pastured meat in Chico was almost impossible. And now we, I'll, I'll actually show you some examples where some of our clients quit their legitimate day jobs and are now raising holistically managed cattle. And, and uh, it, it's really amazing. But I'm going to share a, a few of the interesting kind of clinical stories that we had in the gym. And it, it led into our success a little bit. Uh, this first one, a 62-year-old woman who worked with my wife. Her name's Paula. Uh, this great gal, uh, she showed up every day at the gym and she started training with us in the summer and she had a big brimmed hat and a long sleeve shirt on. 
And I was kind of like, huh, I wonder what she has going on. And if you've been to Chico in the summer, it's hotter than the blazes. It's like 110 degrees, 60% humidity. You don't really need to wear a lot of clothes to, to get warmed up. And I thought that she probably had like some sort of photophobia deal, like she was afraid of the sun, skin cancer. And I'm always in a fight with people about something anyway. And I was like, I don't want to have the vitamin D fight right now. But one day Paula showed up. She said, usually we would take her on a walk to warm her up because when it's 110 degrees and 60% humidity, you can just sit still and you're pretty much warmed up. So uh, she said, I, I, I did, forgot my hat, can't go on a walk. And I said, okay, Paula, what, what's the deal with the hat? And she said, I have porphyria cutanea tarda. So Frank, I'm standing in front of you and I say, I have porphyria cutanea tarda. What do you do? Well, having worked in a, in a hospital, she told me this and I stepped back and I'm like, is that contagious? <laughs> like, is that, is that catching at all? And she's all, no, 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 it's not contagious. It's a genetic disease. And what happens is if she got out in the sun, she would get a burn that would go all the way down to the periosteum of her bone. And I was like, really? How long have you had this? 20 plus years. So I went over to the computer and I put into the computer, I, I search disease states for two things, insulin resistance or autoimmune conditions. So I put in porphyria cutanea tarda and I can barely spell my own name. So I wasn't even close to this, but luckily Google's pretty good at filling things in. And I, I searched insulin resistance, didn't find anything. Put in porphyria cutanea tarda transglutaminase, which transglutaminase is an enzyme that gets activated in celiac disease, which is a gluten reactive condition and it seems to be active in many, many, many autoimmune conditions. And I found some information. I started poking around and it's like, they would say genetic disease, genetic disease that looks a lot like autoimmunity. And so I went out to Paula and I said, hey Paula, I think you have problems with gluten. She said, gluten? Yeah. And she said, like bread? And I said, yeah, like bread. She's saying, if I cut bread out of my diet, I might improve this. And I said, yeah. And she's like, I like bread. And I'm like, I like bread too, but it makes me sick. I think it makes you sick. And so we had this back and forth, back and forth. Uh, she finally said, yeah, okay, I'll give it a shot. One month later, she was asymptomatic from the condition. She's able to run around with a long, you, you know, a, a, a tank top, no hat, chased her grandkids around. About three months later, she showed up at the gym with a big brimmed hat, long sleeve shirt. And I'm like, Paula, what are you doing? She said, well, I ate some bread. I'm like, what are you doing? You know? and, and, uh, but the, the recidivism is a big deal. Clearly, some of this stuff tastes really good. And you know, I figured that chasing your grandkids around and being able to run you know, half naked in, in uh, Chico during the summer would be a, a boon. But the, the bread won out in that case. Uh, another person, 28-year-old fighter pilot. I just talked to a young woman this morning who also has narcolepsy. But this guy contacted me. He became very, very sick in Afghanistan, caught a gut bug, and then after that developed narcolepsy. And as you can imagine, you know, narcolepsy, you get excited and you fall asleep. So if you're coming in for a carrier landing and you fall asleep, it could be bad. So this guy was going to be grounded and he had one more chance to pass his sleep study. He contacted me and he said, can you help? And I said, I'll, I'll try. So I did my same deal, narcolepsy, insulin resistance, didn't find anything, narcolepsy, transglutaminase, narcolepsy is an autoimmune condition. So it was asymptomatic after one month on a paleo diet. So the co commonality, all these conditions have, share antibodies to uh, transglutaminase. Uh, I would argue that most modern degenerative diseases are simply a mismatch between our genetics and our environment. We eat, sleep, live, move, love, interact in ways that are completely contrary to, to the way that we are wired to live. And at some point that becomes pathogenic in us. And I think that we have some templates for figuring out how to reverse that. And this is true on our health and also for the health of, of our soils and, and producing food around the world and solving a lot of problems in the process. So we motored along with all this stuff. Um, we, we had a lot of success because we were able to help a lot of people with the standard gym type thing, you know, I, I want to look good in my skinny jeans and we were able to do that. And then we worked with a lot of people with some pretty complex health con concerns. We had a couple of doctors we worked with that were very uh, uh, amenable to what we were doing. We were eventually picked as one of men's health top 30 gyms in America. And I mean, we're a little, at the time, we were a little 2,000 square foot gym in a, in a light industrial 
storage area. And when the mosquitoes would come out in Chico in the spring and fall, people would get eaten alive, you know? So it was kind of an austere environment, but uh, people liked it and they got a lot of benefit. Uh, we started really influencing the community around us where once you could not find grass-fed meat in the area, we now have three uh, groups of folks that have left their, their day jobs entirely and are now uh, producing holistically managed uh, grass-fed meat, uh, uh, poultry, eggs. Um, it's amazing the transformation that Masa Meats has, has wrought on the land that, that they manage. Um, the, the, the father, who's been running cattle for ages and doing it in a, a pretty conventional fashion, um, he was worked upon by the son, and he's like, hey, man, give me 10 acres and let me fiddle with this, and we'll see what happens. And the 10 acres started looking way better than all the other managed areas, and then they ended up taking that over, and now they've taken over some other acreage. So we, you know, we've had some really great uh, effect. We had some great reach on a local level, and um, eventually I wanted to start putting this out to a, a broader audience. And so I, I, um, I, everybody's familiar with SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. I kind of flipped it around I, in, instead of looking for intelligence, I, I, I started beaming some, you know, in, intelligent signals coming in, I started beaming this stuff out, and I was hoping that we would get some sort of a response, and the response has been pretty good. And uh, so now we're going we're gonna to shift gears a little bit from kind of my personal story to some, some bigger picture ideas about, like, economics, Moore, Moore's Law, and it seems completely random access, and it is, because that's the way my head works, but it hopefully will all tie together. But there, there's this concept in economics called Moore's Law. Guess who came up with it? This guy named Moore. Yeah, it's kind of like he was buried in Grant's tomb kind of, kind of deal. But he observed back in the 1960s that in general, microprocessors and a whole host of processes show this, this uh, tendency. These microprocessors got twice as fast, half as expensive, and it took about 18 months for this to occur. And we're still on this Moore's Law trend. The, the uh, smartphone you have today is better, faster, cheaper than the smartphone you had two years ago. The one two years from now is going to be better, faster, cheaper. At some point, probably uh, Moore's Law will plateau out with technology. But there's usually a pretty good run on this stuff. But it's interesting. If you allow innovation and markets to do their magic, most things follow some sort of a Moore's Law trend for a long time. But I'm going to show you something that hasn't followed a Moore's Law trend. Um, it's interesting. So this. This shows the, the black line, the cost per unit of computing power has plummeted, while computing power has exponentially increased. Um, it is, uh, this is a great one, I, I love this one. Uh, cost of a hard drive, uh, a, a gigabyte of hard drive space. In the 1980s, it was over a mil in 1980, it was over a million dollars for a gigabyte of, of memory or drive space. Today, it's less than a penny. It, it is so cheap that we use hard, uh, uh, these flash drives as mediums other than the intended artifact. It's more valuable as uh, advertising means than it is as actually carrying data around. And not that long ago, it was a million dollar item. Uh, it, it applies across other uh, industries. This is uh, uh, the Human Genome Project, sequencing the human genome. Um, I'll do a little little question here. So, so you see an exponential trend here. It's going down, going down. What, who was looking at this problem here? And then who entered the scene here? Government, private enterprise. <laughs> Pretty cool. And, and this, that thing is actually, should be a round of applause there, actually. Um, yeah. Uh, that thing's actually a logarithmic graph. Like, if, if it wasn't a logarithmic graph, it, that stretches it out. It actually just plummets. It's like it fell off of a cliff. So the government was doing a good job. They were getting a Moore's Law trend on that, and then private enterprise came in and crushed that thing. Now, uh, I think you can uh, sequence a human genome for, like, uh, 1800 bucks, something like that. Like, it keeps getting cheaper and cheaper. So we mo know more about genetics and pathology and biochemistry, we know more about every disease state you could imagine. But check this stuff out. The uh, Congressional Budget Office, very nonpartisan, pretty orthodox governmental agency, predicts by 2030 we will uh, carry 300% of our, our GDP as debt. A massive driver of that debt are 
exponentially growing national healthcare costs. And people will say that this is driven by age, an aging population, it's wrong. Demographics only cause a linear increase in costs. Our healthcare costs, mainly driven by diabetes, obesity, diabetes, and the related uh, comorbidities, that's the thing that's driving an exponentially increasing healthcare kind of kind of debt burden. Uh, some of the the big thinkers in the military look at our economic and healthcare situation as an existential threat to the United States. Existential threats are things that could remove it from existence. Comet impact, nuclear weapons, and the way that we run our economic and healthcare systems are considered to be existential threats, could remove us from, from existing the way that we are. Um, this is an interesting graph that shows an upper and middle potential bound uh, by 2050. If we're lucky, then one in two people will be type 2 diabetic or, or, or uh, peri-diabetic. If we're unlucky, then one in one people are. Awesome odds, huh? And again, this is while we know more about diabetes, insulin resistance than we've ever known in history. If you go to PubMed and you put into PubMed, it's the National Institutes of Health database, that, that repository for research. And if you put into PubMed Diabetes 2013, it will give you a search return of, I think, 30,000 peer-reviewed uh, uh, journal you know, articles on diabetes in 2013. But yet, all of these disease states are increasing at an exponential rate. And I've got to ask the question, hey, how could that be? How do you know more about something, but yet you can't affect change in that process? Maybe we're doing something wrong? I would, I would argue we're doing something wrong. So there's not, this isn't across the board. There's some examples in medicine where things get cheaper and better. And one great example is Lasix eye surgery. This is not actually a very out of date uh, uh, graph. Lasix eye surgery, I think back around uh, uh, 1999, 2000 was about $2,000 an eye. Today it's about $400 an eye. And the interesting thing about Lasix eye surgery, it's not covered by insurance at all. It's 100% out of pocket and it's a highly competitive market. So it, it drives lots of innovation, lots of competition, brings prices down, improves the, the quality of the service. So a quick recap, uh, when technology advances, goods and services improve, costs decrease. We know more about biology, genetics, pathology than ever, but medical costs increase, quality of care decreases, disease rates increase. How on earth could this be so? Like I said, I, I think that we're doing something wrong. So I'm gonna show you an example of how I think we're doing something right. Uh, back in 2002, uh, three University of Nevada Las Vegas police officers suffered strokes or heart attacks. All of these people survived, but when they, when they survived the event, they are medically retired because, it's, uh, uh, because of the demands of their work. It, a stroke or a heart attack is considered to be a workman's comp type claim. It becomes a labor and industry type, type issue. Uh, to retire these folks, it's cheaper if they die. It's horrible to say. It's very expensive if they live. The on the books costs are about $1.2 million. The real cost can be 10 times more than that. How many of you are aware of the massive underfunded uh, liability scheme within every municipality on the planet, or particularly in the United States? Yeah, we are crushed by that. And it's, this is the primary driver. They try to budget one number for healthcare, and the real healthcare costs are much, much more. And again, this is largely being driven by diabetes-influenced uh, activity. So there's an outfit called Specialty Health that was founded in 1993. It was originally an orthopedic risk assessment program. These guys were trying to keep people out of back surgery. It was founded by a bunch of back surgeons that one day said, I don't know if doing surgery on people really does all that much good most of the time. And there's a lot of morbidity and mortality attached to the surgery. Can we do something better by trying to keep these guys out of the surgical scene? So they developed some very sophisticated risk analysis, analysis algorithms, started looking at things. They would go into a work environment and they would look at like a bend and twist deal. They would assign a risk on that, created an insurance package around that. And it was very, very successful. But they, the, the, the story about the university, the UNLV police officers got on their radar and they said, hey, Maybe we could use this risk assessment analogy or, or, or analysis process, and maybe we could find these people early 
do an intervention and prevent them from getting uh, type 2 diabetes and, and cardiovascular disease. So they started looking into that. In the beginning, they would do standard blood work, HDL, LDL, total triglycerides. They would do Framingham scores, which are a very outdated mode of looking at cardiovascular disease risk. They would take these cops and firefighters who ate cop and firefighter diets and put them on an American Medical Association ADA gold standard diet. And you know what happened to these people? They got worse. The cops and firefighters, donuts and coffee and maybe crack and hookers, you don't know how that goes, but um, <laughs> their standard diet was better, better than the ADA diet. We have two years of data on this. It's not an aberrant deal. It wasn't like, ah, well, two people got worse and six people got better and we round filed the results. No, we have two years of data on this where they followed the rules handed down by DASCOV and these people got worse. So our clinicians being bright people and really actually wanting to help these folks, they said, if high carb, low fat isn't working, what do we need to do? Well, they went kind of uh, uh, lower carb, higher fat, uh, we started working with these guys at the National Lipid Association. They are a splinter group that, that broke off from, uh, from the um, uh, cardiology scene. And we've really done some, some remarkable work. We do some NMR testing, which if you guys want me to talk about that, I'll, I can talk to you uh, kind of separately. Um, the current program, we do a yearly risk screening. Uh, we find high-risk individuals, and we put them on a low-carb paleo diet. We do some very targeted pharmaceuticals. I have a sneaky suspicion that nobody has a statin deficiency. <laughs> Make sense? I mean, there aren't statin trees. I know that some statins grow in brown yeast rice and stuff like that, but I, I just have never seen in a book this kind of like, oh, vital human nutrient, statin, if they're deficient in statins, then we give them statin. Right? So standard of care, we have to do this for some people. But the interesting thing, most uh, interventions using statins are about 30 to 40 milligrams of Crestor. We use five. We use a, a dose of Crestor that theoretically shouldn't have therapeutic value, but it does, and we usually use it for about six months, then we titrate these people off, and then they're fine. Another effect of statins is that they're a very potent anti-inflammatory. So I think that there was an inflammatory process that gets addressed by the diet and the lifestyle changes, but we've got to goose it over the hill with the use of a statin. For a while, it, it, I'm still a very contentious individual. I'm a, I'm a co-owner in this place now, and I'm... I'm I, piss these guys off all the time because I'm like, what are we doing? But they're actually the doctors whose medical licenses are on the line, so they're, they're, in, a, they're in a different deal. Um, I'm short on time, so I'm not going to talk about this uh, 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 right now, but um, just understand that cholesterol levels don't tell you the whole story. We need to look at these things called lipoproteins. The example over on your left is an, both people have an LDL cholesterol of 100, the one person has a lipoprotein count of 1,000. They're never going to get cardiovascular disease. This person has a lipoprotein count of 2,000. They have a very high likelihood of getting cardiovascular disease. And I, I, my talk yesterday, I talked a, a good amount about the pathophysiology of how these lipoproteins increase. I'm not going to talk about that now because I don't want a 50% suicide rate again. So, um, uh, so really quick, just some... some uh, you know, shock and awe takeaways. Uh, this is a cop. Uh, let's see here. It's a, a six-month intervention, 33 years old. He started off at 219 pounds, went to 207. LDLP, that's really the big one, the, the second one down, 223, uh, 2200 down to 1,026. This guy was, oh, and the triglycerides, 362 down to 119. We want the triglycerides even lower. But a, a 316 triglyceride, you could cut the guy's carotid artery, put a wick in there, and burn it like candle wax. Like, this guy was literally dead man walking. Um, this person, uh, this is a 10-year, uh, yeah, this is our 10-year follow-up. 10-year follow-up. So LDLP was originally 2,500, now down to 845. Um, 2,200 down to 1,096. So we did a two-year pilot study. Uh, we got 33 participants in this, found 33 people at high risk for type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Program cost was about $1,000 per person. We saved the city of Reno in a very conservatively estimated $22 million with a 33 to 1 return on investment. And there's a side note on that. If we fix the insulin resistance that underlies cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes, what else do we fix? 
everything. Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, breast, colon, prostate cancers, glioblastomas. I mean, you, you end up mitigating disease risk across a shocking number of, of platforms. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, good stuff. So we're making great friends with people. We All work right, Rob, if we could do it in one minute and close One it minute. Uh, we work really tightly with uh, Polyface Farms, clearly the Savory Institute. I do a lot of philanthropic work with the uh, uh, Farm to Consumer Legal Defense Fund. Uh, we were approached by a Fortune 500 company that's very interested both in carbon se sequestration via the Savory Institute and the medical risk assessment program. I'm into the protein, carbs, fat deal. That's where most of my folks follow me. A lot of people were super cranky with me for talking about economics and sustainability, and they were like, Rob, why don't you stay in your own lane? And when these, these guys from the Fortune 500 company reached out to me, I was like, yeah, we're actually right. And I had something I wanted to say to these guys, but Johnny Cash really says it best for me. So <laughs> really quick, I, I, uh, j just to wrap this thing up, I know I'm going to go over just like a minute. Um, so Dr. Jim Greenwald is our head medical scientist at the risk assessment program. This, this still makes me oogly googly, so it's hard to uh, describe this. So Jim Greenwald, this is his dad, Ed Greenwald. He was like second in command at the FBI at this time. This is uh, Robert Braidwood, who is Jim Greenwald's godfather and is the guy that got Jim Greenwald, our medical director, into evolutionary biology and got him into medicine. Now, who is he? Robert Braidwood is the anthropologist who discovered the transition from the hunter-gatherer lifeway to the agricultural lifeway and basically characterized that whole process. So I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today had Robert Braidwood not done what he did, and Ed Greenwald wouldn't be practicing medicine if Robert Braidwood wasn't his godfather. So pretty cool. So thank you. Huge honor to be here. Awesome. Thank you, Rob.